On June 18th, NVIDIA became world's most valuable company, with a market cap of $3.3 trillion. However, it's been a long way for NVIDIA. Since their founding in 1993, they've made a plethora of GPUs. But of all those GPUs, there's a strong case to be made that this, the mighty 8800 GTX, is the most important of them all. Today, we're going to see why that is, delve into a bit of GPU history, and of course, play Crisis on it. So let's get started. Most people will know NVIDIA from their graphics cards, and if you've ever built your own gaming PC, chances are it'll have had an NVIDIA GPU, as they've steadily held 70-80% of the market over the years. Yet if you look at their latest earnings, NVIDIA made an astonishing $26 billion. Yet if we look at the breakdown, only 10% of that came from gaming, whereas 87% came from the data center. In other words, NVIDIA is now successful not because they make great GPUs for gaming, but because they make great GPUs that do things other than render games. And to know why this is, we'll go back in time 25 years. In the early days, GPUs were used for, as the name would imply, graphics things, games, animations, and so on. But around the year 2000, people figured out that they could also be used for certain kinds of calculations, which at that point were almost exclusively handled by the CPU. CPUs consist of very few, very complex cores, which are great at handling things in serial, one after the other. Also where they depend on each other and where low latency is crucial. But there are plenty of cases where you want to compute things in a parallel way. Say you want to add a, the same value to a million pieces of data. And this is where GPUs outshine CPUs, as they consist of many more, but much simpler cores, where the computation don't have to depend on each other and where latency is a bit more relaxed. And here these many more simpler cores can each chip off a bit of that computation. Particularly, people found that GPUs would be very useful for things like molecular simulations and fluid dynamics, and as we'll get into later, machine learning algorithms. However, using GPUs for such tasks wasn't straightforward. GPUs are designed to render graphics. So people had to port these calculations using graphics APIs such as DirectX or OpenGL, basically expressing them as if they were graphics operations. And this required both knowledge of graphics APIs and GPU architecture and was on the whole a cumbersome task. But in many cases, using GPUs for these kinds of calculations, while an order of magnitude faster compared to CPUs, so the trouble was worth it. Which brings us to November 2006, when NVIDIA launched this, the 8800 GTX. And it brought a massive shift in the GPU world in more than one way. First of all, it was a truly monstrous chip. At the time, NVIDIA's biggest chip was the 7900 GTX, which had 278 million transistors. The 8800 GTX came in at a whopping 681. 2.4 times as many transistors from one generation to the other. It really was a big deal. Other specifications include a 484 square millimeter die with a 155 watt TDP, 128 unified shader cores at 1350 MHz with 768 megabytes of GDDR3 clocked at 900 megahertz over a 384 bit bus. And these specs resulted in some pretty outrageous performance. Compared to the 7900 GTX, the 8800 was well over twice as fast, coming in at an extra 112% performance. Even comparing it to their dual GPU flagship, the 7950 GX2. The 8800 was still 55% faster on average. To this day, we really haven't seen a jump between generations as big as the 8800 GTX brought. Secondly, it was the first GPU to offer support for the new DirectX 10 API, which ties in with the heavily revamped G80 unified architecture. To explain the importance of the unified architecture, let's have a look at the basic GPU pipeline where there are two important components, the vertex shader and the fragment shader. In the past, GPUs had discrete pixel and vertex shaders, each responsible for their specific purpose. Objects in video games all consist of triangles, and after the GPU receives vertex data from the CPU, 
the vertex shader transforms this data into points out of which triangles can be created. Later in the pipeline, the pixel shader provides color and texture data before it's finally written into the video memory. Now with the unified architecture, these pixel and vertex shaders were unified into what NVIDIA called the unified stream processor. And the 8800 GTX had 128 of those, divided into eight blocks, each with their own texture units and L1 cache. This change in architecture offered a host of advantages. First, not all scenes are equally geometry heavy, meaning pixel shaders wouldn't be fully utilized. In the new setup, this utilization issue is fixed as now the unified shaders can do both the pixel and vertex shading. Secondly, even more different kinds of workloads could be mapped to these stream processors. For example, they could now do geometry shading, allowing the GPU to generate terrain features like grass on its own. And more importantly, this flexibility of these unified stream processors are an important aspect in turning GPUs into the computational devices they're now so popular for. So we're now here in the labs with the 8800 GTX. And this is quite a neat example, as this is what a video used to call the reference design coolers. In their new terminology, it'd be a founder's edition. But it does come with these quite nice graphics and also with this cool bracket they use to ship GPUs with. And for a test bed, we've also got a pretty interesting setup. As we've here got a EVGA Super Record 2 with two 6-core Xeons, 24 gigabytes of DDR3 memory, and some beefy Cytomugen coolers. So let's get this all installed. For our operating system, we're using Windows 10 Professional with the NVIDIA 341.74 drivers. Starting off with GTA 5, and the 8800 GTX was ahead of its time with DirectX 10, but now 18 years later there aren't many mainstream titles which still support it. But GTA 5 being an older title, it luckily does. And here we're running at 1920 by 1080 with the lowest possible settings. And it is trying its best here, running between 20 to 30 fps and we've maxed out the video memory which i do think is a limiting factor here but if you were to drop it down to a lower resolution you could get a somewhat playable experience next up we have a game which i was quite surprised by to still support directx 10 and that is cities skylines here we're running at the bare minimum settings 720p with the absolute lowest detail settings and it is really rather struggling here even at these minimum settings, we're running around 20 FPS or so. Now granted, with a city builder you don't need blazing FPS, but a little faster would be nice. Nevertheless, if you really wanted, you could play City Skylines on an 8800 GTX. It just won't be a very good experience. And testing won't be complete without Crisis, so here we're running Crisis 2, yet again at 1080p and with the high settings now, which is the lowest for Crisis 2, and it's actually running rather nicely. Even in some intense scenes, we're still getting above 35 FPS or so. And of the three titles tested, this is definitely the most playable so far. And overall, you can still definitely play some titles on the 8800 GTX. It's just that it, at 1080p, the VRAM is a limitation. And you're of course dealing with DirectX 10 and the fact that it is an 18 year old GPU. But overall, not too bad. However, while it was very cool that the 8800 GTX brought a massive shift in gaming and architecture, most importantly, it brought the world CUDA. As I explained before the benchmarks, people really wanted to use the parallel processing power of GPUs, but it just wasn't very accessible. This changed with CUDA, or the Compute Unified Device Architecture. Whereas previously, developers had to rewrite their computations in a way that a GPU would render graphics. Now, they could simply rewrite their programs in C and using CUDA extensions. They could now effectively use the GPU like a massively parallel processor, just in C code. 
However, despite the obvious advantages, it wasn't a success from the start. CUDA needed an install base with applications and users. And what they did then was quite interesting, because in order to grow their install base, they decided to ship CUDA with every single consumer GPU instead of locking it to professional GPUs only. And in this way, they leveraged their gaming customers in order to grow their install base of CUDA over time in the hopes that it would pay off in the end. And this wasn't cheap, they were really taking a gamble on this. And their user base did increase slowly over time. In the beginning, NVIDIA's chips were used a lot in supercomputer applications, say for scientific research, data analytics, government and so on. But in 2012, something huge happened. Three researchers won the ImageNet Visual Recognition Challenge by a pretty big margin using AlexNet. And this was a deep neural network powered by two 3 gigabyte GTX 580s. And this entirely computer trained model beat the best human engineered algorithms. And it's been recognized as sort of the turning point for deep learning. And from that point on, NVIDIA put more and more effort into AI development. In 2009, they had already created GTC or the GPU Technology Conference to bring together CUDA users. But they also worked extensively with training developers, creating more CUDA libraries and so on. They really put a lot of effort into this. However, even despite all that effort, looking at NVIDIA's revenue over time, we can see that by 2015, the data center still only accounted for 10% of their revenue. But over the last few years, a lot has changed. First, we saw the cryptocurrency mining craze, which is a great example of the CUDA install base on consumer GPUs. But while that did temporarily increase revenue on GeForce cards, it wasn't the main source of NVIDIA's success now. And for that, we have to, of course, look at the AI boom of the past few years. And the main force behind that has, of course, been OpenAI with their development of large language models and image generation tools, with, of course, the launch of ChatGPT sort of recognized as the start of the AI boom in 2022. And six years prior, in 2016, Jensen Huang himself had delivered the first NVIDIA DGX1 supercomputer to Elon Musk and the OpenAI team. With ChatGPT later running on tens of thousands of NVIDIA V100 cards. And this year, Meta announced they'll likely be spending billions acquiring 350,000 of NVIDIA's H100 cards. And suddenly, all this work promoting CUDA, creating an install base, training developers, and creating an entire ecosystem around CUDA suddenly paid off. And NVIDIA is certainly reaping the rewards. In Q2 2021, NVIDIA made for the first time more money from data center than from their gaming GPUs. And recently, they became the world's most valuable public company, topping both Microsoft and Apple. With, in their latest earnings, the data center accounting for 87% of that revenue. Now, CUDA isn't the only API for computing on a GPU. On the AMD side, they introduced the unified architecture on the desktop with GCN and the HD7970, and also brought in CUDA's counterpart, ROCM. But that just has not enjoyed the same success as CUDA. AMD even temporarily funded a project called ZLUDA, which allowed CUDA applications to run on AMD GPUs. And over the years, we've seen a plethora of companies offering specialized AI chips, sometimes which even outperform NVIDIA's GPUs. But it's proven difficult to compete with the ecosystem NVIDIA has created around CUDA. And it's even gone so far as to say that experts both outside and inside of NVIDIA agreed that perhaps the deep learning revolution wouldn't even have happened had NVIDIA not added CUDA to the mix in 2007. And it was with the 8800 GTX which started all of this. It was groundbreaking on many fronts, not just in terms of performance during its time, but it practically redefined what a GPU is and what it can do shifting its primary purpose from graphics to computation over time, which is why I think it's NVIDIA's most important GPU to date. But do you agree? Do leave a comment below. In any case, that was all for now. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please do leave a like if you haven't. Why not subscribe to the Fully Buffered channel? In any case, that was all for now and bye bye.